The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back to the X Zone, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, coming to you from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Now, for all of you wondering around the world, saying, where is Hamilton, Ontario? Well, what you do is get a hold of Google Google Maps, that'll work. Or it's, it's on Lake Ontario, and find the city of Toronto, which is the queen city for the province of Ontario. It's our capital city here in the province. Mind you, the capital city for the entire country is in Ottawa, both here in Ontario. But anyway... Toronto is the capital for the province of Ontario. It's on Lake Ontario. Now, just follow the lake along until you see Niagara Falls. Now, we are right in between Toronto and Niagara Falls on Lake Ontario. Smack dab in the middle of the Great Lakes Triangle. If you'd like to give us a call, worldwide, toll-free, 1-800-610-7035. My email address is exxon at exxonradiotv.com. On MSN Messenger, Exxon Radio TV at Hotmail.com and our website, www.exxonradiotv.com. My guest this hour is a Douglas J. Fisichella, and he began his studies of metaphysics and world religions in his early 20s, having been raised in a household without uh, domestic assertions about religion. He wasn't uh, subjected to the usual insistence of one specific faith. Now, his father was one of the country's foremost proponents of esoteric science. He was also a student of the world's religion and a biblical scholar. This early exposure to the open study of various religious systems left its impact in a non-judgmental and assimilating attitude towards all spiritual teachings. Joining me now is Doug Fisichella. And Doug, welcome to the Exxon. Thank you, Rob. It's great to be here. All right, Doug, tell your tell the Exxon Nation who your dad was. Uh, his name was Anthony J. Fisichella, and uh, through the 70s and 80s and into the 90s, he was a lecturer and mm-hmm. a speaker. He wrote a book, in, uh, I believe it was first published in 1984, as Metaphysics, the Science of Life, and that went through like eight printings while he was touring nationally and internationally speaking. Uh, he retired from a lot of the active speaking when he moved down into Florida, but he spent the last 10 years of his life putting all of that he had learned through his study and meditation into a series of books that he titled One Solitary Life, about the unity of all being. And he explained where he came from, a little bit about his journey, and some deep metaphysical principles. And the third book is titled The Christ Epic, and that is an analogy of or an analysis of the New Testament, looking at it with its mystical symbolism and tying it together with the uh, esoteric principles that a lot of people think really reside outside of religion. He was able to unify the two and talk in terms of the evolution of consciousness and the evolution of the soul throughout humanity. Doug, stand by. You and I have to take a commercial break. We'll be back in two minutes. Exo Nation, Douglas Fisichella is our special guest www.higher-ground.com My name is Rob McConnell. This is The X, and we'll be back in two minutes. Don't go away. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to The x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. 
No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. worldwide toll free. My email address is xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On MSN Messenger, xzoneradiotv at hotmail.com. Our website, www.xzoneradiotv.com. Doug Fisichel is our special guest, higher-ground.com. And uh, Doug, what brought you into the world of metaphysics? What was your your um, your reason for, for getting into it? Well, it's, it's kind of twofold. When I was a kid, I was surrounded by it, mm-hmm. with my father running a place called the New Age Center on Long Island, where I grew up. We were surrounded by the teachings and by his students constantly, events going on, being down at the center as a kid, little workshops that we would do and all of that. So I was introduced to it. I was taught how to meditate before I was 10. I was introduced into transcendental meditation at around 12. Um, But I was given the tools, and I was never really required or asked to do anything with them. It was when the urge comes, you'll have the the tools, the ability to meditate. And I would use it for some relaxation and that kind of thing, but I was not a serious student, uh, although I did read some religious texts Mm -hmm. in my 20s, the Bhagavad Gita and things like that. Um, I wasn't really serious about my studies until after my father passed away, and then it fell to me to make sure that the books got published, and I wanted to be more of an expert on what he was dealing with than just an expert on my dad. Everybody's an expert on their father, and I can talk about my father. Um, but I wanted to study the source materials that he came up with his, his theories and his interpretation from. And between studying his work and mastering a uh, 15-hour lecture series that he had given, reading the books and editing the books, it got me deeper into this than I ever thought that I would be. And now I'm studying with the Arcane School in New York that was started by Alice Bailey that my father studied with in the 70s. And I'm also teaching at the Metaphysical Research Society out here in Denver. So I was introduced to it very early on so that I was comfortable with it. And, and later, you know, after my father passed away, I felt that responsibility. So I got deeper and deeper into it. And now it's something that I can't ever see stopping. I enjoy the teaching. I feel I'm helping people. Uh, I love the studying I read every day. And it's really brought a dramatic change in my life that I don't know that anything else would have been capable of doing. Tell me about Metaphysics 101. Well, Metaphysics 101 is a book that I'm writing right now. It's going to be a companion to the classes that I'm teaching. The classes were originally designed by my father and called The Well of Wisdom. I renamed them Metaphysics 101 because it's so inviting it, as you know, anything 101 is the basics. And a, a metaphysician, an esotericist, a philosopher, we're all self-taught, but there's an intimidating aspect to the teachings themselves. And if you can't understand and read people like Madame Blavatsky, my father was there. And if he's still a little bit complex, which some of his writing is is very easy to understand, but he gets into very, very abstract principles, uh, I feel like I'm able to bring them down even further to a level that's easier to understand for people. So through the teaching, I had to write and uh, create syllabus for each class and everything. So I had this outline and I decided why not create a book from it, write it in my own words with my own examples, which is what I'm doing with the classes, taking the same principles and then teaching them in my own way. And people tell me that I have a clarity about the way I teach and that I'm capable of relating those things in a manner that they can understand. So I figured the next step would be to write the book and I've started serious work on doing that as well. Why do you think so many people today in the year 2010 are turning to metaphysics, New Age philosophy, and alternative uh, religious philosophies for answers? Well, you know, I saw something in USA Today that said that 86% of Americans 
did no longer identify themselves with the original religion that was in their family. Wow. And I think that studying something or being uh, within a certain belief system because mm-hmm. your parents did it is probably one of the worst reasons to do that. It has to resonate with you. And a lot of the religious teachings and a lot of the upheaval in the world right now is based on religious differences. And what I see as I study is that the, the more I get into it, the more the uh, religious systems have in common with each other. And I think that that synthetic approach is going to reach people. I think that they're tired of the derision and the division. You know, a Protestant believes this and this guy believes that. And we have a tendency to use deductive reason. So it's natural for a human being to look at two things and rather than seeing how similar they are, what defines them is what's different. And what that does is separate. Uh, separation is the basis really for evil. Anything that's unifying is good, and anything mm-hmm. that's separative begins to become a problem. So I think that they're just sick of the derision and the division, and they want to see something that's unifying. The ageless wisdom principles really do unify all of religion. They are said to be the source of all those religious teachings. And when I look at the different religions of the world, I see so much in common. What separates them really has more to do with the culture within which the teachings were released and taught than anything else. The differences really are cultural. They are cultural expressions of universal truths. So what people really want to get to is that universal truth. And thou shalt not kill was a really good idea long before when Moses went up Mount right. Sinai and came down with the tablets. You know, your dad's first book was entitled uh, The Vision, The Journey and the Quest. What does that tell us? Well, everybody has their vision of what the perfect world would be, and my father had his as well. You know, a world uh, populated Mm -hmm. by people with a higher consciousness, the Moseses and the Jesuses and the Emersons and the Walt Whitmans of the world, have led us in that direction, and they know and they were able to see for themselves what reality was, what truth is. And as we approach that, and as we get closer and more people become enlightened to those ideas, we'll be moving in that direction. So the journey and the quest is really the trip that gets us there. So we're all on this, and it's always likened to a path. And the path, there are many paths, and yet there is only one path. They'll all converge sooner or later. So the journey towards that unified society and the unified humanity, I mean, we're all brothers, right? We're all actually cells within a single organism, the human organism. And the cells in your body are separate little lives, and if they could know what the purpose of the being was, that's Rob McConnell, they would be able to do something better towards moving in that direction. Right now, we're all kind of unconscious of our roles, and the more we become the observer in our own lifetime, the, the vision that we see we'll be able to move in that direction and get ourselves to a place where society realizes that, you know, Jesus said, whatsoever thou dost to any one of the least of these, you do also unto me. He realized that we're all in this together. And while people are suffering in dark four, it's really difficult to, to think in terms of humanity as a being taking care of itself. That's like us ignoring something going on with a foot or something like that. Well, we're going to need that sooner or later. But your brain might say, well, I don't care about the foot. I don't right. need it. So we need to move in that unified direction. Book three is called The Christ Epoch. And yet you say it metaphysical or occult teachings. Now, is this work a criticism of Christianity or of religion in general? Well, the short answer to that is no. It's, it is critical in some of what the Church has done with Jesus' teachings. Mm-hmm. I, in the teaching and in the book, my father doesn't really do, say anything that contradicts anything that Jesus taught. But some of it's been distorted over time. There is a book called Misquoting Jesus by a gentleman named Bart D. Ehrman, and he went back and learned Latin, Greek, and uh, Hebrew Mm -hmm. so that he could 
uh, become a textual critic and look at the original documents that were assembled into the Bible. Well, what he found was astounding. He says in his book that there are more differences between the original texts and the canonized New Testament than there are words in the finished copy. So there's a lot that goes on in those translations and everything where things are lost. But if we look at it with its symbolic nature, then the details don't matter as much. So we can look at the teachings, and we do look at them in a symbolic manner. Jesus always taught in parable or allegory. He would start talking about a mustard seed falling on the ground. He wanted you to figure these things out for themselves. But the symbolism in, in Scripture allows for it to be interpreted at different levels depending on the level of consciousness and understanding of the person who's doing the reading. So all scripture is subject to interpretation, and what we're trying to do is a unifying interpretation of that. Now, there are some things in here that may make the church react, um, but it's not really critical of the church. All it's trying to do is get back to the original meaning of what was being taught, and it's fairly well supported. Now, nothing can be proven. We don't even know if Jesus ever lived, and there are people who will argue both sides of that point. The same thing with Typhius, the uh, head of the Supreme Court of Judea, or Abraham. I've seen things written where they don't know if Abraham ever lived. But if we look at the symbolic interpretation, then it doesn't really matter. What my father used to say is, the story is true even if it was proven beyond a doubt that Jesus never lived, because it's not only about Jesus, it's really about you and the quest for enlightenment of the human consciousness. Doug, stand by. We've got to take our commercial break with the news at the bottom of the hour. Exo Nation, Doug Fisichella is our special guest www.higher-ground.com We're talking about a trilogy of books entitled One Solitary Life and Doug has a book that's going to be coming out shortly called Metaphysics 101. My name is Rob McConnell. This is The Exxon. We're coming to you from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Exo Nation, my guest this hour is Douglas Fisichella. He's a student and teacher of metaphysics and esoteric spiritual principles. He's a member of the Theo... Theo Theosophical, there we go, Theosophical Society and a student of the Arcane School of Lucas Trust in New York and teaches classes at the Metaphysical Research Society in Denver, Colorado. He is the editor of a truly inspiring work on metaphysics, One Solitary Life, a trilogy of books authored by his father, Anthony Fisicali, before his passing in 2004. He is in the process of writing his first book, Metaphysics 101. His website is www higher-ground.com that's www.higher-ground.com Douglas are are you reinterpreting the gospels of the new testament well like i said before um, all scripture is kind of written 
in that way to be interpreted. So I think that each one of us interprets it every time we read it. I read the Bhagavad Gita when I was in my 20s because I was told that it was the central test to the Hindu uh, text to the Hindu philosophy. And when I read it, I started reading about a chariot warrior and and the problems he was having deciding on which side he should fight. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is wrong. Something's wrong. They gave me the wrong book. Well, without understanding the symbolism and the fact that the, the questions that he was asking were symbolized in this battle, I just didn't understand what they were trying to tell me. Well, reading it now, it's the same book, and I interpret it much differently. So the scriptures of the world are written that way. Uh, Annie Besant, in her book, Esoteric Christianity, and I'm going to paraphrase this because I don't know, remember it as a quote, but she said, Christianity is like an ocean into whose shallows a child could wade with depths that could drown a giant. So depending on the consciousness of the reader, there is always an interpretation. So what we've done, and my father has done, and then I have now continued to do, is to look at the symbolic nature of the Trinity and see how it's represented over and over again within the New Testament. The scriptures, they're written so that they can be understood by whoever is reading them. You can read Jesus' story to a child, and they'll understand it in a certain way. But to somebody who's been through seminary school, there's a much different interpretation. So I don't know that we're necessarily reinterpreting it any more than every single human being does when they do it. But the steps that my father took was to write it all down and then to present it to other people so that it would help them with their understanding. He used to say, none of this is mine. It's all ancient, ancient wisdom. And the ageless wisdom of, of uh, the secret doctrine and the perennial philosophy. And all he's doing is taking his interpretation and throwing it in front of people to see what they think, running it up the flagpole, so to speak. What is the significance within the various religious groups if, in fact, Christ did not really exist? Well, Christ is a principle, the principle of consciousness. It's synonymous with the word soul. So if Jesus did not exist, and you're only looking at the symbolic meaning, or using the symbolic meaning, then it doesn't matter, because what we're talking about is the initiatory process. There are five initiations that takes a human being from what we call the human kingdom into what Christ referred to as the kingdom of heaven, mm -hmm. or the kingdom of souls. It's nirvana, satori, um, enlightenment. So we follow him and one of his sacrifices. They call this the passion of the Christ. The passion is a play. One of his sacrifices was to go through this process in public so that it could be recorded and so that it would be understood. He laid out the path and the way. He said, I am the light and the path and the way. And those are symbolic statements. He's not a light. He's not a path. But he is if you look at it symbolically. So we don't really know if he ever lived. But even if he did not, then the aspects of the story that relate to you are true. And you can read any scripture that way. You are the publican. You are the seduce. Or in this case, you can look at the trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as the Father being Joseph, the male principle or spirit. The female principle, the Holy Ghost, is always considered female as Mary. And Christ, the Son, consciousness, what St. Paul called the hope of glory, the uh, what's within you. The kingdom of God is within you. And the awakening in consciousness of that divinity is what the story is about. So if Jesus never did live, uh, I would be a little bit surprised by that, but mm -hmm. it wouldn't matter as far as what the value of that story in our life today is. Otherwise, knowing that uh, Mary was on an ass as she went to Bethlehem, it, those are meaningless details. But when it is the matter, the material body, the female principle carrying that Christ divine nature within it on a journey back to 
the house of bread, which is what Bethlehem means, then you see all of these symbols within that. Lao Tzu's mother's name was Mary, and she was on a trip when she gave birth to Lao Tzu. The virgin birth, there are some 24 of them that my father refers to within the Christ epic, and there are more than that. So there are, a lot of them are born of virgins named Mary or Miriam or Mira or Maya, which all have the same translation because the spirit consciousness is born through its interaction with matter. So are these all the same person or are all these different people and different aspects of different theologies? Well, it's both. It's not the same person necessarily, because we're not really dealing with a person, but it is absolutely the same principle. So when you look at the Trinity in uh, esoteric Buddhism, Mm -hmm. we have uh, Atma, Bodhi, and Manas. And in the Judaic traditions, it's Keter, Hokma, and Bina. And the Christian talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that trinity is represented even again as old as Taoism. Lao Tzu said, from the nun comes the one, from the one comes the two, from the two comes the three, and from the three all things come, or myriad things come, or 10,000 things come, depending on the translation that you read. And there it is again, translations of these ancient doctrines into different languages. You lose a little bit of what's going on there. So if you hang yourself up on the words and say, no, that's Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, uh, that's the only time this is true, you're really limiting yourself. If you look at it and say, look, there are 25 or 30 times that this has been stated in these different scriptures, the supporting evidence is exactly the same. It's just scripture. Nobody was around. As a matter of fact, the people who wrote the Bible didn't witness those events. The earliest of the New Testament Gospels was Mark, and it was written 60 to 80 years after Jesus died. So we're not dealing with direct experience. So I believe that the symbolism was used and incorporated in the telling of the story so that it can convey that deeper meaning. Now, did Lao Tzu exist? I don't know. Did Jesus exist? I don't know. But as long as we look at it symbolically, it doesn't really matter, and we can still take great wisdom out of those teachings, no matter who the personified uh, entity is. I mean, we personify God also, and man is supposed to be made in God's image. Well, God is a heavy, heavy word, and it carries so much baggage with it. There's a different meaning in every person's mind when you say the word God. A lot of people reverse engineer it, and they think now God looks like a man, and he must be the guy that's throwing lightning bolts and, and giving Job a hard time. Well, it's really not. It's just a principle. If Christ didn't exist, if the Bible isn't based on fact but is based on legend, what does this tell us about our need to follow, our need to have a higher power, our need to look into the heavens and believe we're not alone? Well, I think that's kind of hardwired into the human being. We do want to know what's going on. And we go through, you know, the spiritual growth of humanity is kind of recapitulated in every child. And in the beginning, all they have is their physical needs. I want this, I Mm -hmm. want that. You know, I'm hungry, I'm tired, and this is what we hear from our children. And then as they grow up, they realize that they're a part of a family, and then they learn to compromise. And then those group the group consciousness that's exhibited there, it gets into wider and wider circles encompassing the family and then the school and then the community and then we all realize ourselves as Americans and what this is is a widening consciousness. Well, if you've done all the things that you were told to do, you either went to college or you didn't go to college, you got a good job, you're you're married now, you have a couple of kids and you're living this life and you turn around and you go, well, if I've done all of these things and I'm doing everything that everybody tells me I should do, why do I feel so empty? And at that moment, for a lot of people, a switch is kind of thrown, and they start digging deeper into try and realize who they are. Now, Ken Wilber talks about the witness, and this is my mind can witness my body and what it's doing and what it needs. So the real me is not necessarily the body. 
And it's not the desires, because I can imagine, uh, examine my desires and understand why I feel the way I feel. And then we even say it in, in our language, we set our minds to something. Well, who is the me that sets my mind to solving a problem? We move further and further back, realizing the witness isn't those things. So I'm not my body, I'm not my emotions, I'm not my mind. That witness is what most religions call the soul. So then, depending on the culture that's in looking at these issues and the teachers within that culture, they develop these allegories and they develop these things and try to state the unstatable. You know, it's really difficult to use language in order to convey something that really has to be known firsthand. If I say blue sky and you're blind, my my words fall on equally deaf ears. You would have no frame of reference. So they use the frames of reference within their own cultures in order to try and bring these spiritual principles to light. And I think that that's the part of it that's really kind of hardwired into us. We want to know. There are the ancient questions of who am I? Where did I come from? How did I get here? Where am I going? And how do I get there? And when we begin to address those things, religion is where we usually turn. What are the teachings, the philosophies that, that relate these things to us? But if, religion, but if religion be... is not based on fact, but based on legend, is there place for religion in today's society when it's based on nothing but mistruths? Well, I don't know that it's based on mistruths, but it's based on information that has to be apprehended personally. It's a priori. I have to find out for myself, but that doesn't mean that it's not fact. The word religion comes from relegare, and I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. It's a Latin word, and it means to reunite. So the purpose of religion is to reunite oneself with the, the knowledge of your own divinity. So again, the stories themselves aren't as important as the purpose in telling the story or understanding the story. But if, but if, that's, that it but if that is the case... At work, it's what your work makes of you that really matters. If that is the case, religion should be a singular event, not a mass event, or because if religion is to be based on your own needs, your own desire, why then congregate in a church? Where there are many people who are seeking, is, is, is everyone in church seeking their own answers? And if this is the yeah, case, why do they need... you can need... only find them on your own. But that group support system and those discussion groups, I study with a group of women, I study a, a book from Alice Bailey, and then there are other places where I get together with groups, and it's not one teacher, it's a whole bunch of people sharing their ideas about something that's very difficult to understand. So I think that it really is important, as long as you don't think that you have found the only way, because every religion seems to think it has the only way, and then rather than serving its purpose of reuniting us with our own divinity, mm -hmm. they're dividing us from the other religions, which are wrong. They're considered wrong. You have the wrong book, the wrong ideas. I don't think that any one religion has all of the truth. Because anytime you color something with a, a cultural uh, moray, you're distorting it. So we've distorted it here, they've distorted it there, there's little bits of difference because of those distortions. So none of them has the whole truth, but I don't believe that any of them is bereft of any of the truth either. So I think it does serve a purpose, and we are kind of pack animals. We do want to group together and get that kind of support, and that's what society is about as well. As long as there's not derision from one religious system mm -hmm. to another. I think that you need many of them in order to resonate with the different types of people that are in You know what? I, I, I disagree with you. I think that this is where a lot of the wars come from because you have all these different religious factions who say that their God says that they are the chosen people, and we've seen it throughout history that millions and millions have died because of this very fact. We'll be back on the other side of this commercial break as the Exxon continues right here from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, 
Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Exxon Nation, our special guest this hour is Douglas Fisichella. His website is higher-ground.com. First of all, Doug, thanks very much for joining us. Great uh, having you here with us in the Exxon. And uh, one question for you, Doug. How does one know if they're on the right path? Well, that question itself is kind of an indication of the right type of approach. As long as you're checking yourself and you want to make sure that what you're doing stands to reason and makes sense, how do I know I'm moving in the right direction, then I think you are moving in the right direction. If you're just plowing ahead forward, and you mentioned that everybody seems to think, oh, my God is the right God and your God's the wrong God, and they cause wars over that, it's because they're not really looking at what they're doing and they're not examining. We have to be an observer in our own life, an interested, detached observer. You know, we use better judgment when we help a friend with, say, a relationship problem. You can see it from the outside. Mm -hmm. You go, well, look, it really looks like you guys are doing this, and, and perhaps this is what what the problem is. Well, that's because you're kind of detached from the situation. And if you can take a step back for your friend and offer better judgment for him, then why don't we do that for ourselves? So if you question, hey, how do I know if I'm on the right path? I think that you're showing that interested look at what you're doing, and it kind of indicates that you're on the right path. It's like one of the things we say, if you wonder if you have a drinking problem, you probably have a drinking problem. Well, if you're wondering if you're on the right path, you're probably on the right path. And there's a different one for everyone. As long as you are studying and living a harmless life and you're not causing problems for people and you're trying to figure these things out, you're on that path. And there are many, many people that are treading that path. Well, we're all on it, whether we're consciously treading it or not. But when you're asking that question, now you're consciously treading that path and trying to move forward in a, in a legitimate and logical way. Doug, we've got about uh, 40 seconds left. Quickly, what's your take on reincarnation? Well, in order to understand reincarnation, you have to understand a little bit about the spiritual constitution of man, and I elaborated on that just a little bit earlier. We are a spirit, soul, and body, Mm -hmm. and when the, the body is also a trinity of the emotional self, the mental self, and the physical self, and when we die... The only thing that dies away, or the first thing that dies away, is the physical body. And then the astral or emotional body begins to dissipate as well, and then the mental, leaving us with the soul. So the true identity, that witness I referred to earlier, is that soul. That's the you that doesn't die. And when we identify with that, we're not afraid of death anymore, because it's just going to take another body, another set of bodies and construct it like you would take a new set of clothing. Doug, we've just run out of time for tonight. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Exxon Nation, Douglas Fisichella has been our guest. His website is www.higher-ground.com. I'll be back tomorrow night at 10 o'clock as once again we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the Exxon. So until tomorrow night, Exxon Nation, take care of yourself, love your children, because they are the leaders of tomorrow. And always keep your eyes to the sky and your heart to the light. Good night, everyone.